So we're thrilled to present this roundtable discussion with leaders from Raytheon Technologies, an aerospace and defense company that provides advanced systems and services for commercial, military, and government customers worldwide. We're going to be joined by Jessica Alexander, Jason Bunting, Tamiko Peckering, Angela Brooks, Tina Harvey, Christine Shirley, and Justine Ramos. We highly encourage you to join and stay here for us with this if you're interested in lear learning more about Raytheon Technologies, and it will be moderated by our very own Rob Rebar. Please welcome our panel. Thank you, Hunter. I welcome our panel now to uh, turn on their cameras and microphones and give you all a second to do that. Super excited to be moderating this discussion. My name is Rob. I am the community and events lead at Power to Fly. And I've had the good fortune to work with the Raytheon Technologies team on several past events. So really interested in diving into this discussion today. And Raytheon Technologies does have a page on Power to Fly as well, where you can learn more about the company and also apply directly to roles there as well. So I definitely encourage everyone to Google after this discussion, stay here for the talk, but then later Google Raytheon Technologies and Power to Fly and you can find their page and we can probably pop that into the chat as well so you can see it. Um, but real quick, since we've got a big group here, I'd love to kind of go round Robin, do 30 second elevator intros, learn a little bit more about you all. So if you could all let me know uh, your name, uh, where you are in the world, what your role at Raytheon Technologies is. Uh, of course, if you are a veteran as well, uh, love to hear that. And if you any have any fun facts to share with us as well, that would be great. So a lot to cram into 30 seconds, but uh, we definitely want to learn more about you all. And Angela, you're next to me in the Zoom Brady Bunch Square. So let's start with you. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, everybody. My name is Angela Brooks, and I work at RIS in talent acquisition. Um, I am a Navy veteran. I was in the Navy for five years, and I am also a military spouse of 20 plus years. Uh, fun fact about me, um, I have an obnoxious amount of children. I have five kids, including a set of twins. So glad to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. I'm, I'm sure they're all locked away in other rooms right now. They're at <laughs> um, to... school or daycare, yes. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're happy that that's back and, and, and functioning again. Uh, Tamiko, let's go to you next. Hi, I'm Tamiko Pickering. I work at uh, Raytheon Intelligence and Space. I am in security. I, work, I support our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance uh, product line directly. I've been with Raytheon for 11 years. I am also a veteran of the Air Force. I did 11 years, three months, and 14 days. I, I'm not counting, but that number is probably the only number that I remember. Um, for a pre-pandemic, one of my uh, hobbies was I love to travel. Um, since we are not traveling as much, I uh, joined a cult. I am um, actively active participant in the Peloton cult, and uh, that's what I do pretty much in my free time. We have some Peloton cultists here at Power to Fly, let me tell you. So I know I know how it is. Uh, well, thank you. Welcome. Uh, and Justine, let's hear from you. Hi, can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Justine Ramos. I work for Raytheon RMD, Raytheon Missiles and Defense. Uh, in the Dallas location as a training and development specialist, where I handle all training concerns, which includes curriculum development of over 600 personnel, for all of Texas, actually, I do it by myself. It's pretty stressful, but yeah. <laughs> so prior to that, I'm also a veteran. Uh, I was an aviation ordnance man. I actually just got out three years ago, so it's still kind of pretty fresh. Um, as an aviation ordnance man, I actually build bombs and stuff for the Navy, um, which is kind of like pretty far from what I do, but it's actually not. And I can explain that later. But yes, fun fact, I guess I'm a, I'm a dog mom and I'm engaged. I'm getting married um, pretty soon. Uh, my my future spouse is also in the military, so. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much. And Jessica, let's hear from you next. Hey, um, I'm Jessica Alexander. I've been with Raytheon for three years as an operations project manager. I work on a program that does repairs on the circuit boards that go to the F-35. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, I'm in McKinney, Texas. And my uh, pandemic acquisition is this little guy. 
Oh so, my gosh. My hobby Adorable. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's so many uh, new dog parents during this pandemic. Uh, wonderful. Uh, and Tina, let's hear from you, please. Hi, my name is Tina Harvey. Uh, I'm a senior solution architect at Raytheon Intelligence and Space. Uh, I've been with Raytheon for about two years. And as a senior solution architect, I'm mostly working kind of the cross between engineering and business development and uh, really looking at the front end of the business. And um, that's where my military background has really helped. Um, I retired out of the Air Force after 29 years. I was mostly working uh, communications and uh, and it's just been great to be part of uh, Raytheon. Um, I live in Colorado Springs, and what I've been doing over the pandemic is I started playing harp. So I I can play three songs, and I'm driving my family absolutely crazy. I need <laughs> well, to learn. A harp is, you know, and that's a big commitment. That's not, you know, you know, learning the harmonica. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tina. Very exciting. And uh, Christine, let's hear from you, please. Hi, um, I'm Christine Shirley. I was in the Army as a captain um, in the Corps of Engineers. I served for five years. Um, I am in the Dallas area um, as a facilities manager for Raytheon so that I manage um, all of uh, the, the Raytheon facilities, um, making sure that the buildings stay up and running and that we support any construction projects, improvements, things like that as the building um, evolves. Um, I have been with Raytheon since 2002, so um, get, getting close to 20 years now. Um, and a little fun fact about me is I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and so I'm a very big Bills fan. So <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'm sure it's getting cold up there now because it's getting cold in New York City where I am. So, yeah. <laughs> And Jason, our male ally on the panel, can you uh, take us home here? How you doing? My name is Jason Bunting. I'm also an RINS. Um, I work in the digital technology group uh, for, and I perform workforce and talent management. So pretty much all the requisitions you see out on the, uh, on the ether for Raytheon and when it comes to digital technology um, is pretty much what I handle. Um, well, during the pandemic, I remodeled my house, <laughs> um, re redid the kitchens, the floors, all that good stuff. Um, and I'm also, uh, the vice president of the South region for the vet, uh, Veterans uh, Employee Resource Group uh, for uh, Raytheon. Wonderful. And thank you. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you all for being here. Also, thank you for your service as well. And also to your many spouses that are also in the uh, service as well. So thank you all. Love to get into some questions here that we have for you. And if anyone has questions for our panel, feel free to put those into the chat and we will leave some time to get to those as well. Um, but we all know, you know, military life is uh, a tough, um, it comes with both honor and, and sacrifice. But, you know, a lot of, you know, what we don't hear a lot about is moving past military life and that transition into uh, the private workforce. So I'd just love to hear from our esteemed panel here if there are, you know, specific challenges that you encountered when uh, leaving the military and moving into uh, the workforce and, you know, what ways can we as individuals and also as companies help uh, dilute those challenges for you? So again, this is for anyone on the panel who would like to answer and um, feel free to jump in. So I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, so one of the most common things that I see coming from veterans, uh, especially on their resumes, is that they don't have enough information. Um, there's a common misconception that they need to leave off their military uh, training and, and information off their resume, which is absolutely untrue. Um, if, you know, the more information you can put, the better. Uh, one thing I would suggest is to find a mentor uh, in one of the various uh, veteran um, networking groups and, and have them look over your resume and give you some pointers. Um, I know there's a lot of folks on this call that, that um, 
that also help out um, and do some mentoring and stuff like that. So uh, that's the big thing. Find a mentor and make sure you put it on your resume. And I guess I would add on to Jason's comment that um, just viewing the civilian workforce, I think it would be great if companies and employers would think about the military in terms of, you know, many people coming out of the military have never had to write a resume before, have had to interview, um, have had to apply for a job because we're so used to, you know, PCSing or moving to different duty stations. But I think um, it'd be great if more companies um, like what we're doing at Raytheon would, you know, help people out, mentor, you know, give tips on how to write a resume and transfer your skills and understand if you're looking at a military resume and it's not perfect in your eyes, it may be because that person, you know, doesn't have um, a mentor, someone to talk to about how to format their resume. Um, so they're worth talking to because you may pull out information that's not on that piece of paper. And, and I would add, you know, personally, my experience, I was just post-2001 uh, when I exited the Air Force, is I had to be realistic about what I wanted to do versus what I was willing to do. And sometimes you have to take a job that you're willing to do to get to what you actually want to do. I think one thing that I, I you know, personally can speak for myself is I over, I overvalued, you know, or I, I, over, I, I overvalued my uh, experience. Right. And it didn't translate well to the civilian world. I didn't have the certifications that I needed to do the job that I wanted to do in the civilian world that I was easily doing in, in the military world. And that kind of discouraged me, you know, um, but I found a job that I liked and I was willing to do it because there was a strategic purpose to it. You know, it took it, it took about a year and a half for me to get to the job that I actually wanted. But had I not, you know, taken a step back and said, okay, look, this job helps me to keep my security clearance. It keeps me connected with the contractor community that, you know, I'm very, very familiar with. I would have missed out on an opportunity uh, a couple of years later that led me to actually get to Raytheon, you know? So just I would, my unsolicited advice to anyone is just to understand that there's a difference to, for, uh, between what you want to do and what you're willing to do. And that may take some time to get to that, that point of what you want to do. And if I could jump in, I, I also think from the individual perspective, it's important to realize that you're interviewing the company too. And, you know, obviously service is important. Having a mission is important, has been, you know, in the military career. So, you know, finding a company that matches your values and, um, you know, that culture is really important. So take that time to research those companies, to ask, you know, uh, people that you may know in there what that's all about, and find a good fit. And and like Tamiko said, you know, get in, get in the door, and then go after the position, um, you know, that you're really interested in. So I think um, one of the coming when I first got out, um, you know, I was involved still in the reserves for a little bit. Um, and I was recalled while I was working for Raytheon um, back into service. And, you know, working for Raytheon, um, I was really proud of the way that the company supported me um, when I got recalled. Um, and so, you know, to think that I've got to totally give up the army if you still want to do reserves and act in the National Guard, um, that, you know, Raytheon is a place where you can go and be supported um, in that endeavor. So, um, you know, having done it myself, I was real proud of the way that the company did support me, especially when I went overseas. So that's great to hear. And also some of the thing I'm hearing, one thing I'm hearing from several of you is also maybe that connection to, to a mission-based organization and perhaps a mission-based organization, you know, who's not right now reaching out to a, a veteran or a military spouse, that that's something that they should really pursue. Justine, I saw you were going to come off mute. Did, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, no. Um, so when you said, um, you know, Raytheon working towards a mission. Um, just from my experience when I got out, since I told you I was recently separated, um, one of the things I want to point out, um, you know, prior to getting out of the military, they don't really disclose a lot of things to you. You know, I don't think I was as prepared 
Um, if it weren't for a fellow veteran of mine, her name is Heather, thank God, she actually helped me um, through everything. Like she told me that if you don't have a job lined up, file up for unemployment and, you know, make sure to follow up with your disability, all that things. Those are, those are very important. And, you know, uh, one of the, the, the best advice that I could give also when you're applying for jobs, looking for jobs, is that you have to be confident about your skills. You know, you are the 1%. As a veteran, you are the 1%. And you've done things, you've seen things that 99% of, you know, the United States has never done. So don't sell yourself short, you know. If even, you know, put everything on that resume um, and just, you know, just, just do it smartly. And then Raytheon is also is a great company. And they're, they're, they're very supportive. And they make sure that, um, they make you feel that you're you're moving towards a, a mission and stuff. So, because one of the things that I felt like I lost when I got out is my sense of purpose, my sense of mm-hmm. patriotism, which Raytheon fully supports that. So yeah, that's it. That's great. No, no, that I think that is so important. I definitely would. Uh, if any companies are listening or watching this, I feel like, you know, that you think of yourself as a mission oriented company that veterans uh, and military spouses are a great uh, resource that, and I'm sure an untapped resource that you should be reaching out to, um, which kind of takes me into the next thing I wanted to ask you all, which is that, you know, I'm sure like many different, you know, um, roles, you know, there are these myths and preconceived notions that surround veterans' lives and experiences. And um, I was hoping that someone, some of you could shed some light on some of these common assumptions that you've heard. And are there assumptions that out there that might be preventing veterans from being hired? And how can we squash those assumptions? Um, my my most recent experience, I've um, helped at, on a couple of interviews to have p- people join our team, and some of the misconceptions that um, non-military sitting on the interview panel with me were, well, won't the veteran be too intense? Won't they be a, a misfit on the team? Maybe they won't fit in as well because their their background experiences aren't the same. And just having having a real conversation. Yeah, we're, we're the 1% and, and I've been in and I've transitioned and I've faced kind of that ex- expectation of intensity. We're the 1%, but we're a broad representation of the population. So we're the same. I mean, essentially, we're going to be the team members. We're going to work just like any other not, or non-military team. So I've, I've been working to help squash those pre- preconceived notions of that, that level of intensity, I guess, that's expected of a veteran. I would also say, I think there's a perception of the military, you know, and it's, you know, if you don't know a veteran uh, or somebody actively in the military, you can assume certain things based on what media is showing you about the military, and that could be misleading. And so it can appear that veterans are or could be inflexible or not innovative, just following orders, um, you know, could also be that our our leadership style is directorial, you know, or dictatorial, you know, like uh, you're going to do this, it's an order and and done, you know, um, those perceptions are inaccurate, you know, I think the military lifestyle, you know, with spouses and, and everything, you have to be flexible, you have to be innovative, that's expected of you. And so figuring out how to convey that in your resume, in your interview, talking to others and seeing how you can couch things in that way. Be prepared with stories that show your flexibility, your innovativeness, your ability to use situational leadership when it calls for it, Um, you know, a different style. Um, I think that's, that would be really helpful to to, uh, counter those um, misperceptions. Great point. Yes, Angela. I was just going to add that, you know, when I was transitioning out, um, I had heard the assumption that people go in the military as a last resort or that people are un- uneducated and that couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, we have nuclear engineers, cryptologic analysts, um, people that fix ships, people like that are not uneducated. 
A lot of people join the military because we have great uh, educational benefits to help pay for student loans or get your degree while you're in service or after service. Um, so to think, especially in the enlisted um, ranks, that someone is not educated um, or couldn't do a job is couldn't be further from the truth. Wow. Yeah, I think these are all really wonderful points that people should really take to heart. And these are all things that I have heard in you know my life. And I think, uh, as you said, Tina, the, the influence of media for better or for worse often can play a huge role in how we perceive uh, these misconcepts. Uh, um, um, love to circle back again to like this, this, this talk about a mission that we were talking about a little earlier, because Raytheon's military community tagline actually specifically states, we have your next mission. So I want to kind of circle back again to that importance of having a mission and how Raytheon is helping you with that. And perhaps, you know, some stuff might you might not be able to talk about, but perhaps there's even projects or experiences that you've had at Raytheon that you're willing to share that have kind of spoken to that mission forward um, element. So I'll jump in there. So when I got out of the military, I, I transitioned to, I worked in DC for a little bit and then I moved to over to Raytheon. Um, once I got into Raytheon, it kind of uh, really opened my eyes to, to how much they support the military community, especially in the programs and things that they do. Um, one of the programs I was on DCGS um, helps with the UAVs and, and predators and things like that. And, uh, you know, which is something, especially in a combat area, like you really need that overhead support, uh, things like that. And um, I was able to travel around to all these military bases uh, to set up these things, you know, talk to actual people using our systems to understand exactly what what it is they need from us uh, in, in, retro, in, in perspective to, you know, how are they going to com complete their mission and how can we make it better for them? Um, and, and I think there's a lot, I mean, a, a ton of programs out there uh, that we have, especially in RNS, that actually, that, that feed right into that. You know, it, you might not be in the military anymore, but your support and your job is directly impacting those people that are on the front lines. Yeah, and so I work in, in security and, you know, we understand that our job is in addition to protecting, you know, classified information and our classified products, it's to, you know, support the warfighter to make sure that the products that we put out on the field, you know, they actually work. And so it's a little bit humbling when you, I work in McKinney and so well, I work from home now, but I was working in McKinney at the time. So it's kind of humbling when you see a, a, one of our products come back from the field. And it, it absolutely looked look, look like it's been in the field. There's, you know, bullet holes in it. It looks like it's been dropped. And, and to know that you you made that happen, like you made, you were there to protect the, the that item as it went, served our warfighters and came back. And you get to see, you know, the fruits of your labor per se. Um, so so that we understand that our mission is to protect protect the warfighter. And in security, that's, our, that's pretty much our only mission. And if, without doing that, you know, Everyone's at risk. Everyone's at risk. I, yes, please go ahead. Um, I think, you know, what you're hearing here is that Raytheon makes hiring veterans a priority. I mean, there are 16,000 veterans who work for Raytheon. And I love what I saw um, just recently on our uh, internal site, it said military veterans are more than just part of the culture at Raytheon Technologies. They are part of the company's products and services. And so you heard it here, you know, with Tamiko and Jason. And I have a story of a colleague who uh, supports the Blue Eye program. And that is a uh, video management system that was in Afghanistan. And it was the last capability functioning as we were pulling back um, and, and protecting the forces and civilians as they retreated out of Afghanistan. And the uh, field service representatives were 
three of the last people to leave. Um, and they were there through all of the things we saw on the television. So, you know, that, that to me is mission. Absolutely. And uh, I love being part of that. Wonderful. And I have some more questions for you all, but we also have a question from our audience from Kaylin. And Kaylin is asking, does Raytheon offer remote or flexible opportunities for those who may not live near one of your basis uh, offices. So as of course, we're, you know, moving out into the pre post pandemic era slowly, but surely, you know, what is Raytheon's uh, approach going to be to that remote and flexible work? Yes. So we do have tons of remote opportunities now. And if you go to our website and look for jobs, the job will state whether telecommuting is allowed um, we also offer hybrid schedules and that will state it in the job description if that's the situation. And then for those that may be working directly with the customer, um, they may work at the client site or in an office. But yes, we have a lot of um, work from home opportunities at RIS. And Angela, as a military spouse yourself, I know remote and flexible opportunities have a huge impact on a military spouse's military families as well, correct? Absolutely. Um, and as a military spouse, I'll just say that um, RS has been truly supportive. Um, my husband's retiring in the next 18 months, so that's exciting. And I know I have the support from my boss that, you know, if we choose to live elsewhere, we're in Virginia right now, that um, my job can go with me. So being in facilities, um, you know, I think it's important to recognize that both facilities and operations realizes that we need to change the concept of office. Um, and so there's a very big push to look at the office of the future and to understand how are we going to collaborate you know, how, how are we going to take these people that are working at home, that are working remotely, and still make them feel a part of an organization and so that we can function and move forward. So, you know, it's not just, okay, we're going to be at home, but how do we really integrate that person so that when they do need to go into an office, that they can, you know, within a couple minutes, just be set up, right? Um, and so there's, there's a big push there. And, you know, I think it's, we recognize that the term office and, you know, it's changing, right? I think that's great, Christine. And also because facilities and operations and things like that can sometimes fall by the wayside because, you know, oh, we think, okay, that has to be in person because that's the way it's always been done. So I love that, you know, what you're saying about really redefining what that term office even means. And I think that's something that we're all trying to figure out in as we move again, you know, into what the future of work has for us all. Wonderful. Um, so I want to move back to some other questions I had. So, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about transitioning. Uh, so again, so anyone who might be listening, who's looking to transition, I'm seeing what, uh, empl- what other um, uh, outlets does Raytheon uh, have for that transition? So Jason, I know you mentioned that you're part of an ERG. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about some of the work that the ERGs are doing. And also you mentioned, a few people mentioned mentorship as well. So any other programs in that regard that Raytheon offers for people who are transitioning uh, out of military service into um, private? Yeah, absolutely. I'd also like to uh, commend Jessica Alexander. She's also, she's my communication director as well. So she's really familiar with this stuff, but um, the veterans uh, employee resource group is, is just, it's a group of veterans and people that want to support veterans. You don't have to necessarily be a veteran to be a part of the ERG. And that's in the case of any of the ERGs. Um, But the veterans ERG specifically, we, we like to, you know, provide, you know, whenever we get new employees into the company, um, we try to, you know, encourage our site leads uh, because each site will have their own uh, ERG leader uh, to reach out to that veteran, you know, kind of introduce the ERG, let them know we're a resource for them, uh, try to help them get acclimated, maybe introduce them to other veterans, things like that. Um, We also host a, a, a litany of 
of uh, community uh, outreach things, especially towards, uh, you know, disabled veterans, things like that. Um, we, we do a lot with the, or at least in the South, we do a lot with the v, uh, VFW and American Legion um, to reach out to those folks, you know, that are retired, uh, maybe not as mobile as they used to be and try to get them involved. Um, and just uh, like, we try to make it just a welcoming community um, and in an easy transition. Um, like Tamika said, there's 16,000 veterans. Um, there's not a, a single site you can go to that there isn't probably a hundred veterans at. Um, so it, it, it helps. It definitely helps transition uh, whenever you have somebody to lean on and you can kind of at, bounce questions off of and, and things like that. Jessica, did you want to add anything else in, in that or maybe any other formal programs to that Raytheon is offering? Um, just I wanted to emphasize that the, these resources are out there and we as the ERG are super involved and we just ask that the veterans kind of do the same. It's going to take effort, get the mentor, get the, get the networking, make sure you get yourself out there to do that. And kind of segueing into, we, there are some formal mentor programs within Raytheon. And in, in my personal experience, that has been really helpful, both in transitioning and kind of trying to plan my civilian career path. And yeah, so that, that's, that's my biggest. Yeah. Another program that we have is called the Military Skills Bridge, um, we were, which is a, a group of a lot of other um companies uh, have access to it's a website you go out there we post uh, positions out there and what that does it uh, it affords veterans or uh, transitioning military that are in their last six months the opportunity to go and work for uh, one of these companies while in transition and basically it's paid in uh, well you're paid by the military but you do an internship at one of these defense contract companies so it's definitely something i encourage everyone to look into Rob, we have a we have a dedicated uh, military program manager, Marcus Stone, um, who works on different veteran events. Uh, we have quarterly hiring events. We just had one uh, last week for military veterans and spouses. Um, Jason mentioned the DoD SkillBridge program, where we help connect people exiting the service with uh, basically internships at Raytheon, uh, Ray Vets. Um, we also team with GI Jobs, um, MOAA, which is Military Officers Association, Recruit Military, I could go on and on, uh, Power to Fly, you, you know, just trying to reach out to diverse um, groups to connect with military spouses and veterans. Another cool thing we do is we have guest speakers um, for our HR and talent acquisition group to help educate those that don't have a military background um, on programs we have. Um, there is a P program, manager, program manager named John and he did a fabulous presentation on our supply chain program. And he stressed the importance, how valuable military members are to hire because we have the soft skills needed for those PM jobs. And actually we're having a supply chain um, job event today um, and would love to hire some veterans for those type of roles. Wonderful. Well, I think I think that speaks to um, Angela, what you said, and also what Jason said, bringing those allies in, bringing people outside of the community in to educate everyone together. And so I love that, you know, the ERGs at Raytheon are not just for the people who identify as that specific group, but bringing the allies in, because I think that's the only way we can really create real change. And we have some great questions coming in from the audience as well. So I'm going to uh, go to a few of those. So um, one person was asking, as, Ray as Raytheon is a company which offers remote jobs to veterans, what would you say is a criteria that you want them to meet or fulfill? So that sounds just specifically maybe to meet for that remote. And I would also add to that if you want to add anything uh, that you see across the board, you know, what, what is that, you know, special sauce that you're, you know, seeing in a person that makes them maybe a great fit as a Raytheon uh, Technologies team member? I would say if somebody's looking for a remote role and they're a veteran, um, to look at the qualifications, do you fit the basic qualifications? If you do, tailor your resume to hit those key points on what we're asking for. Um, and then when you get the chance to interview, highlight those soft skills, that you have good time management skills, that you can manage and juggle 
projects, um, your creativity and flexibility that can speak to your ability to work a work from home job and complete the duties necessary for the role. Yeah, one of the biggest things I think is to be a self starter. Um, you know, you have you you have to motivate yourself sometimes to get the job done. Um, you know, so if, if you're not good at working independently, you're probably not going to be a fit for that position. But um, definitely, as as Angela said, if if you uh, you know if if you do have those soft skills, make sure you bring that forward. Um, she, she hit the nail on the head. That's the thing that I always, I, I tell literally everyone that I mentor. If when you look at the, the requirements for the position, make sure your resume lines up to that. You know, if you don't have it, make sure you have, you put in the, des, uh, you highlight the desired where you fill those, uh, those uh, uh, requirements. Um, if you can't, build your resume to where it looks like you're a fit. They're going to do that. You're not going to make it past the HR person, the TA folks. Um, they, they scrutinize those heavily because we do get a lot of candidates that come in. So you want to make sure that your resume stands out ahead of everybody else by tailoring it to that position. Wonderful. That was awesome. And I would, yeah, please go ahead. Oh no. Cause I was explaining earlier. Um, so uh, I previously mentioned that I'm an aviation ordnance man. So basically I build bombs and stuff, but I work in training and that's what I wanted to do. Now, one thing I'm pretty sure everybody has done when you're in the military, you've probably worn many hats and you, I, like me, I've worked in supply, quality assurance, you know, it's, and, but since I want to work in training, I tailored my resume into like the training things I've done in the military and made sure that the job description from the job that I'm applying for uh, has like keywords in, in the in the resume. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that helps because I'm not, I don't work with for HR or anything like that. So I heard that the machines read the resumes first before it gets to them or something like that. I'm not sure. So, but, um, but yeah, I think that's, that's very important to tailor your resume to what you want to do and some of the things that you've done in, in the military. Like I remember when I first wrote my resume, it was, it was all over the place. Like you, I've done supply quality, but uh, I remember uh, one of my, my mentors uh, telling me that, yeah, that's, yeah, it's not good. It doesn't look good. <laughs> so, yeah. And I will say that I am the machine. I, <laughs> I look at all those resumes, not, we look at all the resumes. We do sometimes add pre-screening questions um, to make sure somebody has the required clearance or the year's experience. But I can tell you that um, all my wonderful team of 90, I think, plus recruiters, we all look at the resumes that are um, sent in for application. Wonderful. But I do think, Justine, you do bring up a good point. Sometimes people think, oh, okay, I'm going to write my resume. This is my resume that I'm sending out to everyone. And like that is not the way that you can think you really do have to craft that resume based on that job that you are highlighting different skills as we've heard from you all. So I do think that is some really uh, wonderful advice. Um, some, more, some more great questions coming in here. So a question again from the audience, building a su successful individual career as a military spouse is one of the key things to one's independence and identity. How does Raytheon as an organization emphasize size on that what sort of approach do you take to the importance of this so i'm a military spouse and i dropped my linkedin link in the chat so anybody can look at my background um, my career has been in government contracting um, so i've worked at a few different companies um, as we've moved with the military but i have to say um, this is the first position i'm in where i feel like I can offer ideas and they're accepted. I can say I want to volunteer on a project and it's, I'm told no problem. Um, they know I'm a military spouse. I'm very upfront about that when I talk about um, being hired anywhere and um, they appreciate that background and unique experience that I bring to the table. Um, so I think at RIS, you make your career what you want it to be as a military spouse and you can have that uh, independence and um, 
try out different paths until you find your niche. Um, and we just posted an article the other day about somebody that's been at Raytheon and worked in three different positions from operations to program management and how she's done that and how supportive the company is. Yeah, and we have couples that work at Raytheon. I can't tell you how many times we have a, the military, the spouse actually gets the job before the veteran. And then she, uh, you know, the spouse actually helps get the, you know, get the military person transitioned into in the door. So um, it's definitely uh, family friendly and uh, it, it definitely gives you your own independence um, just because, you know, your, your husband or wife is a, a military person doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the job. You're going to have to prove it on your own. And, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, the spouse outshines the veteran. Uh, and, and some of the programs that I've been on. So uh, definitely don't shy away from us uh, for that specific reason. And Rob, um, going back to the beginning of our conversation, when we talked about assumptions made, I think a lot of spouses may get passed up on because we may have breaks in employment um, or have to move often. So you may see uh, employment for one year, two years, three years. Um, I, I hope that companies are giving people the chance to explain um, their pathway and why it was the way it was. Um, as a military spouse at home alone, we do a lot of project management. So if someone was a stay at home parent um, or just moving with their spouse, I'm sure they did project management at home, budget management, having to you know orchestrate moves. Um, that's something that I think more employers need to think about when they think about hiring military spouses. I think that's an awesome point because that goes back to what we were talking about, the, the preconceived notions. I don't understand how you could say a veteran or their spouse could not be flexible when they have to pick up and move every three years. So that, that should just in itself show flexibility and the ability to adapt. Totally, one, of the yes. things, one of the things I've liked about our company is, you know, when I first got out, I, I was single. I was a veteran you know, started working for Raytheon and kind of as your life changes, um, you know, I, I've been able to work with Raytheon and accommodate those changes, right? So when I decided to have children, um, you know, raising a family is a little different than when I was single. And, you know, now that my children are getting older, um, you know, they, they've got a lot of different varieties of types of work that you can get into um, that kind of suits your needs as you, as you grow as a person. Right. So, um, you know, look at that within the company, um, whatever company that you choose, um, because just what you want now, whether it's remote, you know, some people just, oh, you know, I want to be remote 100 percent. But, you know, five, do five years down the road, where will you be? And, you know, what, what company has the ability to make those changes? Right. Yes. Wonderful. You know, and I think that's one of the benefits from working with a, a company with the scope of Raytheon Technologies. There are, there's places to move, and, you know, both literally and, you know, in terms of job opportunities and really work on all these different projects and really, you know, the company can let you grow as you yourself are grow and evolve as well. Um, some more great questions here. Um, so, and this is, a, I think, a question we get at a lot of Raytheon technology events. And uh, this person is asking, how significant is previous experience in the same field for a transitioning veteran while applying for a job? So it doesn't necessarily have to be the same field um, it can be relevant experience. Um, one, one thing that we've, uh, we've negotiated with our leadership and, and a lot of the, the HR folks is, you know, military veterans aren't spe specifically going to come out with a STEM degree, which used to be a hard requirement. Uh, but they're, they're starting to see that, you know, it doesn't necessarily need a degree, uh, but uh, experience in lieu of. Um, I'm sure some, you know, Angela and them can touch on this, but uh, one of the big things I, I've noticed uh, as far as hiring uh, veterans is, you know, they, they all have the right certifications and stuff, and, but they might not um, have their, their uh, details in their resume that 
like we said earlier, speaks to the position that you're looking for. That's why it's important to make sure that you use the same key buzzwords and things that are in the, the requisition that you're applying to in your resume, especially you know when you have that experience. That's what you want to highlight. Um, it does, like I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be a one for one. Um, if you have relevant experience, that will be just as good as as um, having, you know, uh, the direct experience. And and uh, just to follow up with what Jason said, as a hiring manager, when I get a resume for a um, for a position and the person is a veteran, of course they're not going to have the same skills because some of the things that we need to do in security are very industry specific. So I won't expect to see them, you know, on the military side. However, those skills may be adjacent to what we need. Right. If you know, um, if you know security, I'll take that over, you know, someone off the street. And also, and also look at a resume, especially of a, of, of a military veteran. Um, I, I'll look at it with the eyes of a veteran because I have that experience. I've been on the other side, and so as I'm reading a resume to to someone who doesn't understand, it may look like this person isn't qualified. Well, I can read kind of between the lines, and I, I'll say, okay, let me bring the person in because. A lot of military people, we don't know how to translate our skills uh, from the military world to the civilian world. And so the interview is where you get the understanding of the person's actual qualifications. And aside from all of that, you know, the one thing I look for is A, personality, but B, does the person have the ability to learn? And that's where some of those uh, misconceptions or, or preconceived notions about military people come into play. Oh, this person, you know, they're very, you know, type A or they, they're A, B, C, and D. They're not flexible. They're not willing to learn anything new. Well, you know what? That That's a myth. And that's when the, in, the interview uh, comes into play. And that's why as a hiring manager, you know, I'll go outside the lines and take a chance at interviewing a, a, a veteran specifically, even if their resume isn't a one-for-one -one match for what we're looking for in the actual job posting. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll also say that it can help, um, like in the military, you could have experience um, doing project management. Uh, if there's an opportunity to get a certification that the rest of the world understands, like a PMP, you know, project management professional, do that. Um, because then it's a... Um, you know, a translation of, you know, not only did I do it, but I'm certified in ways that you understand. It could be in the financial community, could be, like I said, PMP, it could be other um, um, technology certifications. And those help because that, again, is you have the experience, now you have proof in a, you know, a civilian sense of what your qualifications are. But I wouldn't let that stop you. Like Tomiko said, um, you know, Submit and do your best to, to leverage your network of people who are former veterans or spouses that are in, you know, the civil service, you know, working in the civilian world who can help you. Well, you know, you said this, but I think, you, you know, it might be better if you couch it in this way. And that can really help. Yeah. And one more thing. There's a lot of uh, military experience translators out there. Uh, we used to have one on our website. I'm not 100% sure if we if it's still up on our military page, but um, Google, you know, uh, you know your your job code, um, and see if there's a way to translate it. And a lot of times they'll have you know kind of the civilian layman's terms uh, of what it is that you did that you can add to your resume to help kind of the you know the on the civilian side understand exactly what it is that you were doing. And that's a that's a great um, tool, Jason. And actually, that that kind of reminds me just just kind of going back to kind of an overarching question that we've touched upon throughout this conversation. But are there specific skills that jump out at any of you that someone with military experience uh, have that translate well to a role at Raytheon? Maybe these are skills that they should be highlighting on their resume. So anything that really you know, definitely people should be highlighting. One thing I'm just thinking off the top of my head and, and yeah, hopefully, maybe hopefully this isn't a preconceived notion, but I would imagine that a lot of people uh, with military backgrounds have worked with people across different time zones, across different cultures, obviously both within, you know, their own units, but also with other cultures, you know, in other countries and throughout the world. Uh, so maybe anyone can talk about 
those skills and any other skills that people really should be putting front and center on uh, their applications. So I, for me, I think a lot of military um, active duty or reservists um, have a sense of um, creativity, flexibility, teamwork, adaptability. You know, some people think people are constantly at war, which is not the case or hiding in office, um, not true. However, there's a lot of sailors that are on ships, Marines on ships, um, airmen and infantrymen that are on the ground deployed. And in those environments, you kind of have to go on the fly sometimes and make things up as you go. So I think companies should value more like our ability to think outside the box and be creative in certain situations. And then when you're speaking about diversity, I think we have a unique uh, perspective and viewpoint um, that could improve a company's um, position in terms of just um, offering new ideas that could help the business improve. One of the things that I, I typically look for whenever I'm going through resumes is technical skills. Um, a lot of people bury them inside, you know, different things, you know, they, they bring up that they were, you know, a troop leader or, you know, uh, some, some kind of leader and their management skills and things like that. Um, and a lot of times they're applying to individual contributor positions. So we don't necessarily need you to highlight the management side of it. We need you to highlight the technical stuff. Now, one thing I will say is that's subjective because of the position that, you know, each of us are in, you know, Tamika, she has a whole different set of requirements than I do in digital technology, um, you know, since she's in security. So she's looking for more security based stuff. I'm looking for like system administrators, network admins, engineers, things like that. So it really depends on the type of position that you're looking for. That's why we're, we're trying to tie everything back to the requisition that you're applying to, because that's really going to tell you what they're looking for and what you need to highlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would imagine, Tamiko, uh, I know we've had this question in other um, hiring events we've done, I believe with Raytheon, if you have a currently have a security clearance or maybe you've had one in the past, is that definitely something you should highlight in your yes. application? Uh, yes, it is. Um, and I also wanted to add too, um, I, I had the privilege of working a veterans only hiring event back in 2019, pre-pandemic. And it was very, very enlightening because when I was getting out of the Air Force, I did not take advantage of those, but it was it helped me to really get an idea of how veterans actually transition. You know, looking at some of the resumes, it was interesting on the military, look at my humble opinion and from my experience, the military makes you as smart as you need to be to do the job for the military, right? And so you have to be, you have to be very, very uh, strategic uh, and proactive about finding things to help you to transition, you know, from your military role to your civilian role. And, and that can be very tough. So I would encourage anyone who's, you know, within six months of, of you know, leaving the military, go to these virtual events, um, connect with people on LinkedIn, we're all here. Um, find any groups that can help you uh, to review, you know, work on your resume because, because it matters. And I kind of, and I miss doing that because we actually used to do that a lot within uh, Raytheon here in the Dallas area is we would sit down, we have these veteran only working events and networking events and we go over the resume and some of the questions are very legitimate. And so making sure, as Jason said, your resume aligns with the role that you're applying to is number one. And number two, be accurate about it. <laughs> you know, Don't oversell yourself um, because the, the questions about your qualifications will come up. And it, it matters that you, it translates well, it's accurate, and that you can articulate those skills that you have, those soft skills specifically, that aren't asked for in a resume. No one's gonna ask you, do you have adaptability? Are you flexible? Um, what are your time management? You know, can you manage anything? What are your project management skills and not related to a PMP? You know, maybe a project that you worked on at home, um, at, at work, that's not related to a particular role. So just, you know, that's very, very important. I would just encourage anyone, take advantage of those opportunities. This is a good one. Um, and, you know, I offer myself as a resource. I love reviewing resumes. I love re sitting down because, you know, having that connection, you know, we are, a, I want to say brotherhood or sisterhood, but we are. And, and that's why we do these events because we want to help you, you know, uh, be successful as you transition into the civilian world. 
Wonderful. Yeah. And I think, I think so much of what you said too can be applicable to people who are, are not even veterans. I think so often people, you know, they wait until after they graduate from university or graduated or they get their certificate program. It's like, okay, now I'm going to start networking. It's like, no, you really have to start that before you're done, really get those grew, you know, those gears moving uh, because it does take a while as we all know. And it really is about building uh, your network. And hopefully you're going to connect with all of our wonderful speakers today on LinkedIn and, and through Power to Fly. Um, but before we run out of time, I want to kind of go just round circle once again to get everyone back into the conversation. Just share one piece of advice that you would have given yourself, maybe when you were, you know, transitioning uh, out um, of the out of service, or, or maybe one thing that you would have done differently, just kind of elevator pitch style um, that you would have given your 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 younger self that piece of advice. Um, so I don't know who wants to kick us off. I'll go first. Um, I, a piece of advice I, I give to myself would be to be patient. Take the first offer that you get. Um, you know, make sure you shop around and, and you like like we highlighted earlier, you know, really investigate the company that you're working for and make sure that it lines with, you know, your own morals and, and, and your goals going forward. Um, you know, I, I, you know, got lucky and in, in, with the ability to transition to, to other positions, but um, the first position I took out of the military was more out of reluctance than it was, um, you know, me actually wanting to be at that company with at that job. Um, so if, you know, especially if you have some time before you're transitioning or, um, you know, you have some time before you need to take that next step, Make sure that the company that you're looking for, uh, to, to work with uh, matches what your goals are. Wonderful. Anyone else? So TAPS doesn't, or the transition program, they don't tell you everything. You have to do research on your own. Unfortunately, um, you have to help yourself sometimes. And uh, you have to, you know, line your ducks in a row before you get out. That's very important because do you have income coming in before you leave? You know, uh, make sure you set up your uh, unemployment, your disability. That's that's very much key. Your disability is very important, and of course, don't uh, Raytheon is my dream company. So don't stop until you know. Just just keep like uh, applying for jobs and and building your network and all that stuff. Just you know, just keep believing in yourself. That's it. <laughs> I would have to second the last statement you made, Justine. Be confident. I, I wasn't very confident when I transitioned. And also as a military spouse, every time I moved, I wasn't confident. And then learning to articulate your knowledge and skills was really important. Um, I know we're kind of surrounded by military when we're in, but you know civilians. So find someone, go talk to them about your professional career in their terms, and, and they'll kind of help tailor that articulation. And I, you know, building on Justine and Jessica, yeah, totally um, work your network. And that network is both your former military who are now out in the civil sector, not just to get a job with their company, but to have them review your resume, make sure it translates, but also your civilian network um, to, to ask those same questions and make use of the resources that are available to you. The ones that are available to you like TAP, but others that you're going to have to seek um, on your own and start early. Um, you, you really don't realize how much time it takes and hold out for what matches your desires, your skills, and the culture you're looking for. And, and I would say, um, if I were to talk to myself 20 years ago, I would say, uh, take advantage of any certification programs and education opportunities that you have while you're active duty. Um, and it definitely helps to, to not only get the certification, but the training associated with it, because there are some jobs that where you need training a certain certification and experiences. And sometimes there's no way around that. So absolutely, no matter how crazy it may be or how, how outside of your job jar it may be, you, you never know when that one skill that you learn will be super important for a role that was designed just for you. I think one thing I would tell myself when I first got out is, you know, keep those relationships that you do have in the military. Um, you know, I 
I ended up moving to Dallas and there were quite a few friends that I was stationed with that, you know, we've, we've now been friends for 20 years, you know, and some of them I've had an opportunity to work with at Raytheon. Um, and, you know, those are the, the godparents to my kids, you, you know, they're, they're the ones that we served with. Right. And so they, they will always be in a special place in your heart. Um, and, but they can be your battle buddies, um, going through life too. Right. So, you know, don't, um, don't dismiss them as you walk out the door, uh, keep them with you because they, they're a great way to network. They're a great way to, you know, to bounce an idea off of, um, and, you know, it takes a village. Uh, I'll add um, that you need to take ownership of your transition. You can't expect people to do things for you. Um, like Justine mentioned, TAC can only do so much. I encourage everybody create a LinkedIn profile, reach out to people. I know it's scary to reach out to strangers, do it. Network, there's America Corporate Partners, DOD SkillBridge, there's free certification programs, research jobs if certs are needed, get the cert before you get out so you know you have more confidence in applying for those jobs that need certs. But also, um, I recently read an article of that most veterans leave their first job before two years hits. Um, most likely because it wasn't a culture fit. So like um, others mentioned, really interview the employer and make sure it's a good fit for you um, and aligned with your beliefs and values. Wonderful. So yeah, some of the big things I was hearing, you know, do your research, um, you know, do, um, you know, do that extra work. Uh, and I certainly in terms of doing your research, I definitely encourage anyone who's listening to this to check out Raytheon Technologies page on Power to Fly. There's more information about their roles, also their benefits on there. Uh, you can look at some past blog, uh, past blog posts that we've done highlighting um, actions that Raytheon Technologies has taken as well. And you can apply to roles directly on there mm -hmm. as well. So in addition to the wonderful links that I know my colleagues have been sharing with you all in the chat, definitely would check that out. And I just want to thank you all so much for uh, your time today to our wonderful panel. And of course, also thank you for your service. Uh, we really appreciate you being here today. And uh, I'm, you know, hope I'm thank you so much for spreading the good word about Raytheon Technologies and for sharing all of these great pieces of wisdom. So thank you again. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.